Well, about five years ago now, a group of us came together, and this was at the time when Kosovo was in the news, and there was a lot of people who had been displaced because of war, and there was a sense that we as natural builders wanted to respond to problem areas in the world. And a group of us came together, and we talked about it, and realized that we wanted to form some sort of response. And so that was the, the birthing of Builders Without Borders, um, the organization to really help to address some of these ideas. It's been a small organization, and um, we've had several projects, mostly in northern Mexico, as well as um, my work in South Africa, the recent um, project in Dentalton, the, the was part of a it was partially a building with the Builders Out Borders project. The the main philosophy behind Builders Out Borders is that we're never going to solve the housing problem or the dwelling problem through simply going and building houses. Um, we, we realized that we didn't want to become sort of an ecological habitat for humanity where we just kind of build things for people. We realize the main way in which we can really make a difference is through uh, teacher training. So one of the, the our main sort of resources that have, has been generated out of that is in this book, uh, Building Without Borders, which is um, about sustainable construction in those places that need it most. So in this book, I attempted to distill the best lessons learned from people who've been engaged in this work for, for quite a long time, people like Kelly Lerner and Bill and Athena Steen, and who've really been in the trenches and have, have learned how to, to do this. The, the challenge we find is that what you need is a really deep connection with your local community. And coming from outside, that takes time. So the, the people who have the most success are those that have an ongoing relationship with a group of people or community or place. So there's a sense of trust there. There's a sense of that you're in partnership. If you're going in as a bunch of people who are wanting to help or do good or something, um, it just becomes just a continuation of that same paradigm. But once you realize that if you're traveling to a place, you are getting as much, if not more, out of that experience than the people that you are working with, then it becomes more of a two-way street and there's a sense of partnership for a mutual goal. And that becomes just a different thing. And I think it, it increases the, the possibility of success because there's less of an imposition of an idea that's coming from outside but more of a, let's, hey, let's figure this out together. And so that's been really influencing the work. It's pretty unique in development work, and many of us do not have necessarily backgrounds in development work, but we have been on the ground, we have been learning, we have been trying to take these lessons learned to make what we do really something that can survive on its own and ideally be replicated within the local cultures, create situations that can improve it, things really not just you know just push another problem down the, the the pipeline, which is so often the case with most development work, is that the so-called solution just creates a new problem. We're trying to avoid that as best we can, and to really create something that can help people bring themselves up to another level of um, prosperity and health and community wellness. So that's what's I mean, inspiring. One of the things me that this work. we're finding is that. You know, there's nobody home in these so-called institutions that are to serve these things. I mean, we've witnessed the, the incompetence in the post-Katrina situation. I mean, that's just the, the, the state of it. And so those of us who have a certain sense of greater understanding of how the global systems work are now attempting to come up with some ideas that we can bring into the, these places that really need those ideas. And there are people who are Well, I, I somewhat, as far as responding to post-peak oil, I'm, I'm starting to have a, a different sort of take on things. 
and that is that I don't really see we're going to solve this problem by creating ecological communities outside of our existing cities and communities. What I rather see is a, a sort of a retrofitting, if you will, of our existing places so that they will function better. There is no real benefit in tearing down um, a non-ecological house and then rebuilding a more ecological house and to replace it. In a sense, so much embodied energy has gone into the original building, it's better to, in many cases, to, to improve and add to. So what I'm seeing is much more ecological renovation of existing cities, existing buildings, in a way that will allow us to gradually become more local. My, my thing lately is just to look at, okay, if there are no cars or fewer cars, what does that allow? And one is, let's plant up our parking lots for one. And as I'm walking around, I, I consciously live in downtown, so I don't have to get into my car as much. And so I walk everywhere. So I'm seeing starting in downtowns and invigorating downtowns, allowing them to be as self-sustaining as possible is going to be key. So downtown Santa Rosa, I'm looking at places where the land is underutilized in some way, or where can we tuck in affordable housing projects in existing little scraps of land that may not otherwise be attractive to a conventional builder? How can we be creative with our existing places that we have? How can we bring these public places into our existing neighborhoods to help invigorate them and have people recognize the village in their own midst and instead of creating it physically recognizing it and strengthening it as it is now so we can apply all of our ideas though of natural building and ecological design uh, permaculture etc to our existing landscapes in a way of renovating our existing places Certainly there will be opportunities and the desire for people to create communities that are self-sufficient in perhaps more rural areas or just outside of cities. So I'm seeing that there's going to be a combination of things. But I think personally the, the lion's share of the effort should go towards improving our existing communities where there has already been such a huge um, investment of infrastructure. The biggest challenge, frankly, and I'm sure that you're getting this from other people, are going to be the suburbs. What do we do about those that are inherently just wrong-headed, but yet exist? Do we take them apart? Do we rework them? That's going to be, if I were a student now and wanting to take on a really challenging project as a thesis of some kind, that's what I would focus on, is how do we make a sustainable suburban landscape or take what we have now as a suburban landscape and turn it into something else um, without necessarily just wiping it off the map. That, to me, I think is going to be one of the biggest design challenges of the 21st century, especially as peak oil makes those communities incredibly undesirable because of the, the costs of heating them, the, the costs of driving to them. They are going to be the white elephants of the future, yet exist. Valuable materials such are in them. How do we take that embodied energy and... Uh, do some sort of creative work with it to make it available to, to people in a new way. Um, finding ways in which people who live in these communities can actually come together more, do, do larger scale projects like taking down their fences between their yards, closing off streets, reclaiming asphalt, um, perhaps creating pedestrian networks through backyards. I think there's a lot of creative possibilities that have yet to be um, explored and at the same time creating real centers to these places which are somewhat now anonymous and they don't have any places so in, in terms some concentrated development in certain areas where aspects of these places would become would have some town centers to them 